folks. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. I do have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask them, but go ahead and use the Q&A feature or chat. Um, we will not be unmuting mics today. Um, Jim, would you prefer to have questions held towards the end or questions asked as you go along? No, ask them as they come up. Um, so if, and if you can help me out there, Bree, if you see a Q&A come through, yep. just interrupt at a as I change slides or something. That's, yeah, that's a great way to I can go. certainly do that for you. Um, and then if you are viewing us on Facebook, there is still time to join us in Zoom uh, so that you can ask questions. Um, the other thing that I will say is, is that we um, don't, don't forget to uh, head over to Beanstack, which is our community engagement platform. And you can mark uh, that you attended webinars throughout the week. We have a special uh, Start Omaha um, event going on. And um, if you mark and uh, that you've attended webinars, you can enter to win some prizes. We've got uh, gift cards going from a couple of really wonderful small business, uh, small businesses here in Omaha. And then we've also got a heads, uh, headshot session. Ooh, having trouble talking today. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and paste a couple of URLs. The other thing is, is we are recording this so that if you want to view it again, it will be available on our YouTube channel later next week. Um, so here are a few helpful URLs that you need to get, get started on that. And today we have uh, Jim Reef with us here with the Nebraska Enterprise Fund. He's going to be talking about uh, borrowing basics. And I see that Leo also just popped in. And Leo is also from the Nebraska Enterprise Fund. Um, and so I will just, it's one o'clock. I'm just going to turn it over to you guys. Hey, Bree, thanks a bunch. We just want a, a big shout out to Do Space for all they do for for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Um, this is, I, Brie, you'll, I'm not even going to guess, but I've been with several of the start weeks that, that do space has been coordinating and this is exciting to be back again this week um, today we're going to cover a little bit about borrowing basics but real quick before that I'm Jim Reif the executive director at um, the Nebraska Enterprise Fund we're what's called the CDFI a community development finance finance institution we have revolving loan funds available for small and micro businesses we have training just like today and in a plethora of other trainings check out our website at netbiz.org um, there's training going on all the time and Neil probably will be putting a few of those in the chat box as well um, as well as do space um, do space has a huge number of trainings going on um, all year long and especially this week so a huge shout out for that the third thing we will do is we have one-to-one -one coaching and counseling sessions with with small business owners or folks even that maybe am I, should I own a business? What, what would it be and all that? So we're, we're happy to meet with you on those topics as well. So feel free, like Bree said, any moment, just type in your questions in chat or in the Q and A, probably the Q and A is a little easier for us to manage, but either way, we'll get the question addressed. Um, and I just want to, also shout out Leo Martinez is here. He's our business mentor and loan officer. He's also um, both English and Spanish. So if you have a, a Spanish language need, he will be the person to take care of you. He'll take care of you in a great way. So like I said, we're going to talk about borrowing basics. This is kind of a high level um, discussion about what, what makes sense. What do we want to look about, look at when we're thinking about credit, taking a loan and what's the difference between credit, what's the difference between a loan and so forth. So some of the things, and that's exactly some of the things we'll talk about what is credit, what is a loan. We're gonna talk about why, what's secured, what's unsecured loans, what's the difference. We'll talk generally about three different types of loans. Obviously there's all kinds of nuances within that. We'll talk about some of the costs of what it, you need to get a loan and some of the factors that um, we and other lenders would look at. Um, we'll talk real briefly about installment versus rent to own. Probably not a lot of detail there. 
We'll give you some tips to think about before you take a payday loan. Um, and we'll talk about what you can do to protect yourself at least somewhat against the predatory lending practices. Now, unless somebody really wants to, I'm going to skip the pre pretest. Um, but there is a participant guide that we're going to stick in the chat. There, that's yours to keep. You can print it out. You can save it. It's a Word document, and Aunt Bree will also send a follow-up email um, with the Google Drive with that. So, to begin with, credit. Um, if we ask our financial analyst or financial professional what credit is, are they going to say it's money you give back that you get, but you don't have to pay back? Probably not, right? Money you borrow and pay back for things, but you must also pay it back. Recognition for a job well done, or the scrolling through at the end of the movie. It's probably not the, the scroll through at the end of the movie giving credit to Mark Hamill for his role in Star Wars, right? Probably not that recognition for a job well done. It is, though, money that you borrow to pay back. Um, and that's the thing about credit. When somebody gives you a loan or gives you credit, they expect to be paid back with a return. So keep that in mind. I get the question a lot. Oh, isn't this just a grant? And it's like if, it's a, if you've signed a promissory note, it's probably a credit. It's probably with the expectation that it's going to need to be repaid back. So just wanted to be clear. Um, credit's your ability to borrow money. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes we call it a loan. So most of the time we're going to be used to hearing credit and thinking, oh, that's my loan. And it's basically a promise that I make to pay you back or, or you make to pay me back or um, you make to pay back the bank that you borrowed that money from or, the, or Chase One or Capital Two or whatever the credit card you use happens to be. Why is that important? Um, because having good credit makes it easier to borrow money in the future, actually. My dad moved a few times and he used to tell me that he would go into the bank and take out a small loan when he moved to a new community and he would pay that back over six months or eight months because that way if he ever needed money from the bank, they already knew that he would make good on his promise to repay. So if if he did have a real emergency and needed to borrow money from the bank, he'd be able to go into the bank. Um, and that's because he established credit with that local bank and he took the time to borrow and repay on time and according to the conditions. So why is credit so important? Well, all of us know um, there's times, especially in today's world, sometimes we don't even carry cash in our wallet. Um, you can ask my kid that, because she'll come up to me sometimes, Dad, can I have 20 bucks? And I'm, like, I'm sorry, I don't have 20 bucks in my wallet. It's, it saves me a lot of money. But sometimes we just don't have cash. And with today's world, we can use credit cards. Or, in, you know, or you might you put something on, on your line of credit or whatever. So it allows us to not have as much cash. Sometimes we need credit in a time of emergency. Uh, my other daughter, who's 19, I... I had her get a credit card and not because she needed it, but because, you know, if she's in college, what happens if she has a flat tire or what happens if she needs a couple hundred dollars for an emergency? She now has a credit card so she can pull out her credit card and use that at the time of an emergency. Um, it allows you to pay for purchases over time. Um, some of you probably have a car and you probably... Most of us don't have the money to go into the dealership and say, here's the full price of the car. I want to buy it, drive off the lot. Most of the time, we want to pay for that over the life of the car. So if the car is going to last us for five years, we want to be making payments over five years. So we're paying it as we use it rather than paying for it up front. Um, the other thing we need to be aware of, credit can actually affect um our ability to employ, find employment, if, depending on, on what kind of employment you're working looking for, oftentimes employers do pull credit ratings and they'll, they'll see um, how you've handled your funds. So you want to know, and we'll talk to you about how to find that shortly, but you want to make sure you know what's on your credit report so that in case you're looking for a job, it can affect that. It can affect your housing and what you end up having to pay for housing, depending on your credit. Um, it can 
affect how much you have to pay for insurance. Insurance rates might be higher if you have lower credit. That stat, um, they've proven that 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 oftentimes um, increases risk risk factors. So we really do need to pay attention to our credit and keep keep track of that. We get all the time what goes into to what affects your credit score. And there's several different factors. There's five in general. Um, first one is the biggest one, and that's your payment history. Do you pay on time? Um, and do you, are you paying on time? Are you current? And so forth. Second one is what do you owe? So this looks at how much do I owe? Am I using my full credit or am I using just part of it? General rule of thumb is you, you want to keep credit cards active, but you don't necessarily want to keep them open. You definitely don't want to max them out if you can avoid it because that, that hurts your credit score. So we'll, you know, we can talk a little more there. And they look at your credit history, okay? How long have they actually had credit? Um, then there's always a little bit they don't tell you much about. And some of, that's some of the other stuff they'll look at. And then they look at, um, are you applying for new credit? And if so, how much and, and where and what kind? Now, that's a tricky one, though. Oftentimes, you have to be careful. Um, say you're going to buy a car. Oftentimes, one dealer will say, well, don't pull your credit again because it's going to keep dinging your credit report. If you're buying a car and shopping for a car, you can actually pull credit at three or four or five different car dealerships as long as it's within the same type of activity. So buying a car and over the same time frame, usually one and a half to two weeks, and then it will only hit your credit score once. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Don't let somebody scare you into not pulling your credit. Um, if you're looking at making a major financial purchase like a car or a home or something like that. So those are some of the factors. Well, those are the factors that go into our credit score. They're reported. They're scored differently. Um, FICO is one of the most common. Um, and they, they have all kinds of different versions of FICO. So that's something else to be aware of. If you're buying a house, the bank might use one, one FICO score. If you're if you're buying a car, they might use a different FICO score. So there are different re reiterations of the same data. So just something to keep in mind. Um, what is collateral? And this is, we get this question all the time. What is collateral? And basically, it's your security. Um, it's your pledge to the lender that you're going to repay the loan. Um, and if the, if you, end up not repaying that loan, that's what the lender is entitled to come and get to, to pay off what you owe. Most common, we think of real estate as collateral. So, and the easiest example, if I, if I take a house loan um, and make, take out a mortgage, you know the bank is gonna take the house as collateral, which makes a lot of sense, right? You use you used the money to buy a house, the house is guaranteeing that you're going to repay that money. The same thing if you buy a car, the car typically is the collateral. The bank retains the title and they can come get the car if you stop making your payments. So that, that's the idea of collateral. Um, it's typically something you can see, feel, touch, something that is, is easily quantified um, and so forth. Some credit terms we want to make sure you know. Um, Oftentimes you hear, oh, they want a guarantee. And a guarantee is a form of collateral. It's basically me giving my word that I'm going to guarantee to repay the bank or the institution. So it's, it's a form of collateral. We talk to here a lot about secured loans. Secured loans are just like the ones we talked about, a mortgage, a car, pay, a car an equipment loan if you're in small business. Um, that's usually something that is secured with a piece of collateral that can be um, taken and, and sold um, on the market. Then there's unsecured loans. These are loans and they're, they're typically more expensive. Um, and credit cards are perfect. Most credit cards at least are a perfect example. These are loans that don't have any collateral backing. So basically they're legal documents or legal obligations 
but if you don't pay your credit card, there's they can't come and take your car. They can still um, file and come after you through other means, but they can't. They don't have the right to take a, a specific asset, and an asset is something valuable you own. So it might be your, you know, it might be your watch. It might be um, some paintings. It might be your house. It might be a car. Um, it might be equipment for a business. Um, it can be a lot of different things, but that's what an asset typically is. I know I'm moving fairly quickly. Are there any questions up to this point? I don't see any, but I could be missing them. Okay. Um, um, one of the no. loans we're going to, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to tell you, I'm not seeing any as well. Um, okay. And just to remind folks that the chat and the Q&A are open. And I don't see any, I don't see any on Facebook either, Jim. All right, thanks. One of the um, loans we, we see a lot are in consumer installment loans. And these are a loan that you take out. Um, typically, you take it out for personal expense for you or your family, okay? And this might be, a lot of people have a, a credit card or a, an, an account with NFM. You go down to NFM and you buy that new sofa and you get to take the sofa home and they get they usually give you 12 or 24 months of either zero or low interest and you pay them back over those 12 12 to 24 months at the end um they stop bugging you and, and that sofa is 100 percent yours so that's an example of a consumer installment loan i'm taking this loan for my personal use and to use that a second type of loan is credit cards the nice thing about credit cards is this is ongoing. Um, you can borrow money for your household, family, other personal expenses as you go. Just remember credit cards, and we oftentimes see this, credit cards can be risky because it's really easy to max out a credit card or two or three credit cards. So you really wanna manage your, your credit card use um, to make sure that you're doing it well. But credit cards, the flip side is they're super handy. You walk into a grocery store, and you don't have any cash, you haven't gone to the ATM yet, you can pull out your Visa or your MasterCard and use that instead of cash. And then um, that goes on to your, you owe that, but not immediately, you owe, owe that at a later um, point in time. Another loan is a home loan. And this is really common. Um, this There's a couple different spaces in the home loan. The first one is the home purchase loan. And this is primarily used when you buy your first home or your second, you sell your first home and buy your second or wherever you are, but it's it's using that to buy, um, buy a home. The second one is a home refinance loan. And a lot of people are refinancing their loans right now because interest rates are lower than they have been for a long time. So maybe you owe, let's just say you owe 70,000 at 4%, you might work with your, your institution and they might say, hey, we can give you 70,000 at 2%. So you might refinance at a lower interest rate. There's other reasons to refinance, but that's one of the more common reasons. The third thing is a home equity loan, or sometimes they're called HELOs, home equity um, line of credit or HELOCs. Um, and it's basically, you're borrowing against the equity that's already in your home. So you're basically taking a second mortgage um, and taking that value of equity out of your home and bringing, borrowing against your home to get more cash. Okay, and how the home equity works is oftentimes we look at what's the value of our home. And in this example, it's $250,000 um, value of the home. This particular example, the owner still owed $200,000. So that means they have equity of $50,000. That means their home is worth, probably worth $50,000 more than, the, than their mortgage is. So that means they have some equity. That's hopefully everybody, as you buy a home, hopefully you're building equity as you go. Now, typically, this is a general rule of thumb. Each bank is slightly different. They might have slightly different criteria. But typically, if you want to take a home equity loan, 
you can take up to 80% of your home value. So in this case, 80% times 50,000 turns out to be $40,000. So say the homeowner wanted to, well, this is pretty common. They needed to put their kids through college. They would be able to borrow probably in this case about $40,000 that they could use then to pay for their kids to go to college. Or if they wanted to fix up a kitchen, they, they could borrow up to fifty thousand or $40,000 to build to fix up their kitchen. Um, so that's, that's how a home equity loan works and so forth. So back to the credit score. And this is, this is, there's always a lot of questions about credit score. What goes into it? How do I figure this out? And there's a lot of things to think about. First of all, we want to always think about building our credit. We don't want to think about repairing credit. We want to think about how do we build credit? How do we take it and use what we want? The first thing you have to do is actually, you have to be using your credit. So you need an active account or multiple active accounts. And, and by that, we actually want different kinds of accounts. Um, you want the credit card helps, it's a revolving loan. A student loan will help build credit because it's a term loan. A mortgage will help because of it's, uh, it's a term loan. So you're looking at different types of loans. That doesn't mean just go take out a loan just to build credit, but it does mean having a blend of different types of borrowing products is going to help you build credit because you're using it. You're you're developing it. So you're basically, you're taking, getting credit from the bank, you're borrowing the money, you're, you're using that money, you pay back a little bit of interest um, to the bank. And as you do that, that's going to help um, the credit bureaus understand, um, are you using that credit well or not? So what the credit of the bank will start to do and the credit card company, they will now, um, talk to the credit reporting agency. The, so they, in the Nebraska Enterprise Fund, we work with a group that helps us. They're called Credit Builders Alliance. They help us get all the information about payments and they actually report it to Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So for folks that are making credit payments on time, that we, we, we tell credit builders in our particular case, they then report to one, each of the three main um, credit bureaus. Numbers do matter. Different people will tell you different. Anything less than 600 is usually considered poor credit. Anything above 750 or so is usually considered excellent credit. Um, depending on what you want and depending on what kind of money you're borrowing, different people have different thresholds. I just talked to a banker yesterday and their internal threshold is about 680. I've talked to some banks, theirs are 700. For mortgages, it oftentimes is a little bit less, but as you get a lower credit score, you tend to pay a little bit more in, in interest. So you do wanna pay attention. And here's the thing, don't worry where you are today in terms of, of getting dinged. What is, really, what is really important is that um, we need to think about where do I want to be? So there's their strategy and there's things that we can do to, to um, help build our credit. And so don't worry about where you are. And the only other thing I will be careful, be careful when you go, oftentimes somebody says, I can repair your credit for a fee. Those are oftentimes um, situations you need to really be careful of and think through carefully. So. Now, the fun part, the cost of credit, you might say, and I, I get this all the time, well, your credit is so expensive. Um, there's different things that go into credit. One is the fees, and that's the fee that the financial institution charges for activities to review your application. Um, most banks will charge a fee um, to take out a mortgage or a fee to take out a business loan because that helps recover some of the costs that it that we undertake um, to look over your prospect, to, to understand if it makes sense, to cover our costs, legal fees, searches, and so forth. So that's the fee side of it. 
and always look and know what the fees are. Credit cards also are, are notorious for fees. They'll have a fee if you pay late. They'll have a fee if you do this. They'll have an overdraft fee. So make sure you understand the fees. The fees are intended to, to cover the cost um, of, of reviewing and servicing that account. Interest is the money that you pay to the financial um, institution for using it's money. I like to think of it as rent. If I if I borrow a hundred dollars, I'm renting that hundred dollars in reality. So I'll, I'm going to pay a little bit of rent money for that hundred dollars. So it might be two percent, it might be one percent, whatever it is. Think of it as that's my rent price for using that. So that's the interest I pay for using that. And interest can be both mixed or sorry, fixed um, and variable. And fixed means that. For the whole life of the loan, it's 5%. It doesn't matter what happens outside. I signed an agreement. I said, this is a 5% money. So the bank will collect 5% um, for the whole year. In some cases, and this is pretty common with um, mortgages, they'll give you a variable rate. And the thing to be careful about a variable rate, right now interest rates are super low. So you're going to get a super low rate. Who knows what the interest rates are going to be in five years or 10 years or 15 years. So if interest rates go up to 8%, your variable rate will readjust from 2% today to 8% or 9% um, in the future. So you want to be real careful. There's there's a purpose. It's, it's fine to use either one, but you need to be aware of what is your condition. You know, if it's a short short-term loan, it probably is not going to matter so much. If it's a long-term loan, you, you want to think about, oh, is it likely that loan prices are going to go up or are loan prices going, or interest rates going to go up over time or go down? And my, my personal view right now is since interest rates are so low, it's going to be hard for them to go much lower. Okay. Another thing we often forget, and this is especially on the consumer side, is we all have rights. Um, and as a consumer, you have the right based on the truth in lending disclosures. This is federal, um, the Federal Truth in Lending Act requires that banks actually tell you what the charges are. So you can just, you can actually compare the cost of the borrowing. And this, this includes how much is being financed. So are they financing 100,000? 80,000, 60,000, whatever that happens to be. It's the annual percentage rate, and there's a calculation of what goes into that. Um, it, they have to tell you about the finance charges, and they have to tell you how much um, the total payment will be. And this is really important. You know, if you're buying a car, you have the right that when you go into the finance office to, to figure out the payment of that car, car they should be telling you this. So if you go to Volkswagen and you go to Toyota and you go to Honda, each one should be able to give you a disclosure showing you exactly how much is being financed, what's the annual percentage rate of that, how much of that is finance charges, and what would be my total payment um, for that entire period of the loan. Second, and real briefly, I'm just going to talk real quickly here um, about rent to own. I know there's quite a few in, in, in and around the area. And one thing to be aware of is you'll say you want a washing machine. And the rent, you go to the rent to own, they say, oh, you only have to pay $6 a week for your washing machine. So they set up a payment plan. They don't actually give you right to ownership. They own that washing machine for the for the whole plan. So maybe it's 100 payments. And obviously, yeah, maybe it's 100 weeks, 100 payments, 600 bucks. So you don't really own that until you make the full $600 or full 100, 100 payment. If you miss a payment, even if it's number 99, they can come in and take that, that equipment back for it from you. So Oftentimes, there's a little bit more risk because if you don't make a payment, they'll come and take that particular item. And also, they do charge. They're, they're, they're basically putting their finance fees into the cost of, of the process. So you, 
while your payments every month or every week might be low, if you think about what it would really cost to go to an FM, for example, um, rent to own typically is much more expensive or the value is much less. So maybe you pay the same, but you don't get the same quality of merchandise. So just keep that in mind for rent to own. I'm not saying don't use them. There might be a place where it makes sense, but I, I, I think you need to really keep in, keep in mind the risks involved and the likelihood that, that the cost is going to be higher than if you can um, find other ways to purchase the same thing. So this, I need some ideas here. What can you do if you need money fast? So what, what can you do if it's two days um, or two weeks away from payday, your credit card's maxed out and your car just broke down? Um, you only need a couple hundred bucks to repair it. What can you do? Where can you find that money? Does anybody have an idea? Seems like a quiet crowd, so we'll we'll move on. Well, one one thing is oftentimes, oh, well, I'll go to the payday lender. I'll get money from the payday lender, right? That's that's pretty easy. There's a lot of them in Nebraska. They're easy to find. And I know the laws have changed, but one thing to be careful of with payday lenders is the cost of their services. So say you only needed two hundred dollars. You only need it for two weeks, right? But the payday lender says, yeah, we'll give you $200. You just write us a check for 230 when your next payday comes in, okay? So you write the check for $230. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad, $30 for 200. Really though, it's 391% interest dates. Um, 391% interest rate, sorry. Um, if you compound it over the year. So it's it's a lot more expensive than just $30 when you think of it as an annual cost. Now, if you can't pay it, the payday lender actually doesn't really care too much. They want their money eventually, but you, they're going to just charge you another fee. So instead of owing $230, you now owe them $260. So you can see where it adds up really fast. Or if you take out another one um, a week later, it, you can see where, you know, $30 here, $30 next month, in two weeks, $30 in a month, $30 in the second month, and so forth. It all adds up very, very fast. So that's something to keep in mind with payday services. So what are some options that you can do if you need money fast? The first one, and we always suggest this, is borrow first from yourself. And start building an emergency fund, an emergency savings account. And that might not be big. It might be scraping by and how do I put $5 away every week? How do I put $10 away every week? How do I put $7 away every week? The, the point is it doesn't need to be big, but you're starting to put away a little bit of money every week. So that if you have an emergency, you can go to your, your, your emergency fund. So, you know, obviously the more you put away, the faster that fund is gonna grow. But sometimes if money's tight, $10 might be what you can afford. $5 might be what you can afford. 50 weeks, $5 a week for 50 weeks is $250. So if you can put away $5 a week for a year, you'll have $250. If you can put away um, $20 a week for 50 weeks, um, that's $1,000. So Keep in mind that it's it's that whole idea. The small little bit builds up to be something bigger over time. The second one um, is you can always look and, and shop around for where can you get the better um, APR. For example, if you're looking at using um, a money lender or or a payday lender, there's a program called um, Lending Link, and they they have money that's much much cheaper. So maybe look and see if you qualify for their their support. Um, look around and see if there's, you know, if you're using credit cards, which credit card is the cheapest? Um, there's a lot of places that have cheaper APRs, annual percentage rates. The other thing is to check out um, with your bank and what, what emergency options do they have? Um, 
they may have a short-term loan product. They might let you take an overdraft, especially if you talk to them ahead of time. They might be able to give you a three-month loan, um, especially some of the savings um, banks and so forth have more opportunity, federal credit unions have more opportunity to maybe be able to provide you with some emergency cash options. Okay, moving on, switching slightly, we're gonna talk about the four C's next. And this is really um, what bankers, besides looking at your, your credit rating, they're gonna look at your four C's. Sometimes they talk about five C's. The first one is capacity. Um, and we'll talk a little more in detail on that. That's, do I have the ability to make loan payments? Okay, how am I gonna make that loan payment? Capital, this is where they look at the value of your assets and they look to, at whether you have a net worth. Um, character, um, are you paying your bills on time? Are you, do you have a lot of past dues or, or are things paid on time? <clears throat> Remember for credit reporting reasons, you wanna keep get things paid within 30 days. Um, you never, always pay on time, but if you're gonna be late, make sure it's paid less than 30 days late, and then it won't show up on your credit bill. And then collateral, and this is kind of tied to capital, but it's what, what are you able to put up to use to secure your loan? And then the, actually the fifth C that's not on here that banks talk about sometimes is conditions. The condition of your business, the condition of your vehicle, the condition of the house, the condition of, of your job. Is it a good job? Is it a high paying job or is it temporary? Um, and so forth. So those are the C's that we look at. So the first one, capacity. They're looking for your ability to repay. So how long have you had your job? How much do you make for each month? What are your monthly expenses? If it's a business, it's going to be how is this business historically been profitable? Does this business have um, seasonality? Has this business typically been able to meet its suppliers' um, demands and meet its its credit demands? So it's looking at can this business or can this household or can this person make the payments that they owe? The second one is capital. How much money do you have in um, how much money do you have in your savings and checking accounts? You know, if you go to the bank and I need a hundred thousand dollars and you have fifty dollars in your, your account, it's gonna be hard for the bank to be able to say, I feel good about extending money. So it's how much do I have available? Do you own a house? If you do, how much equity do you have in that house? Um, do you have other investments, other assets? If it's a household, do you have a car? Is the car paid for free and clear? What kind of car is it? Um, if it's a business, do you have equipment? Do you have inventory? And what might those, those be worth? A third thing is character. And that goes back, have you had credit before? Have you had a relationship? How do you work with the bank? How do you work with the credit card company? Um, if you had student loan debt, how did you work with um, your, your creditor there? So have you had credit? What kind of credit have you had? How many accounts have you had? Have you just had one account? Have you had three? Um, and so forth. Then they will also look, have you ever filed bankruptcy? If so, when was the last time? Um, what was the situation? You have outstanding judgments. Um, have you had property be repossessed or foreclosed upon? So have you actually been collected upon? Have you made late payments? And, and um, what kind of late payments have you been making? Is it common or is it just a one-off? Um, whoops, I, I made a mistake. I, I made that late payment at the last minute. So. You know, th those I'll tell about your character, and that's something we as lenders look at. The fourth one is collateral. What do you have that can physically guarantee that loan? So if you have a car that's owned free and clear, that might be something you could use as collateral. If you have a house that has some equity, some banks will, will allow you to use some of that equity as collateral. 
Um, in a business, do you have inventory that is is easily converted into cash? That that might be considered as collateral. Um, do you have equipment? Do you have a specialty equipment? Do you have um, something that that is hard to get that um, is worth something and becomes value? That's collateral. The fifth one, and I, again, I don't have a slide for it, is conditions. And that comes down again. What's the condition? Um, how secure is your job? How secure? Um, how how well kept is the house? How well kept is your your vehicle? So it's it's the conditions of of your house or business as well. So what can we do if our credit? We talked about it. What if credit's not so so great? Um, several things to do is keep paying your bills on time. Um, make monthly payments in full. Make sure you're, you're paying that full monthly amount. You want to check your credit report. You want to do it regularly. And you want to keep your balances in control. This suggests 50%. I actually would argue that 30% is better. Um, some would say if, if you really want to manage your credit, keep um, your outstanding amounts at 10%. And so say you have two credit cards and each of them is a thousand. Instead of having two thousand two hundred dollars on one credit card, you're better off having one hundred dollars on one credit card and one hundred dollars on the other credit card. Okay. So these are just some of the tips. The other thing is always remember the more outstanding and further the older the account, the more it's going to hurt you. So if you had something 60 days try to get it to 30 days if it's 30 days try to get it under 30 days so that will also help you improve credit keep paying it so that it moves to that next lower 30 day um payment back uh, history um the other thing if you if you don't have dings you're fixing you can look at taking different types of credit like we talked about earlier so credit card is a revolving loan a car loan is actually an installment payment each of those helps you build credit in different ways because it shows that you're capable of managing different types of credit accounts. Okay, things we want to watch as we're using credit is we want to watch and be careful of um, predatory practices. And that is oftentimes you see it um, on late night TV and on the computer. Hey, we'll get you money fast. Well. You need to read the fine print. I've heard of cases where, where the agency that's providing that credit is set up, say, in New York. And New York has different laws than, than Nebraska. But if you, as soon as you take the money from New York, we, we then um, fall under New York laws. So they can do things that you can't necessarily do in this state. Um, so predatory might be that. It might be their collection practices. They might not be open about your loan terms and what the cost is. I've gotten calls, sure, we want you to take a credit. And I asked what the APR is. Well, it doesn't matter, sir. You just need this credit and you're only going to have to pay $100 a week or whatever. Well, what's the APR? Well, you only have to pay $100 a week. So they, they are not telling you what the cost of the money is. They're just telling you, here's what you have to repay. Things to keep aware of with predatory loans. These are typically more expensive than other loans. So they cost you more money. You have to pay more in interest rates. You have to pay more in hidden fees. Um, and they have re they often are repayment terms that are very difficult to meet. Leo and I have both seen businesses that have gotten into the predatory loan cycle where the lender takes their it hits their bank account every day of the week, Monday through Friday. So even if you don't have money in your bank account, it will draw that money on Wednesday. And if you don't have it, they don't care. They charge an, a late fee and your bank charges an overdraft bank fee. So you want to look for that. What's the conditionality? Um, how do you get a hold of somebody? How do you make sure that, that um, the terms are reasonable? The other thing I've seen Oftentimes, besides charging higher higher interest rates, they oftentimes will make payments due over a year when you might need three three years or four years to actually manage 
that particular debt in a safe way. So keep in mind there are predatory lenders out there. Um, I can't say don't use some. In some cases, it might make sense. Just make sure that if you need to use one, you understand the terms and conditions, and you understand um, what the ramifications are of doing that. Um, obviously, having a good relationship with your banker or your CDFI or other program is going to help you, um, so you don't need to get into that. Things you can do when dealing with predatory lending. First is working with people with good reputations, working with the bank, working with a CDFI, working with somebody Um, credit opportunity, shop around, get ideas of cost, and then decide what price for you. And also, what options are best for me. It's your right to shop around. And then read and understand all the terms and conditions. And I know some of those terms and conditions, I swear they write in about two point font, but make sure you understand what you're signing and. No, if you want to take it home over. There's Jim. It's like All right, Zoom may have had some issue. Yeah, I think Zoom had issues. It kind of kicked me out as well. So okay. if you want to try and share your screen again, we apologize for that. But All right. Think Thanks, everybody, for hanging on. I will get my screen back up. I think at this point we all all are are well experienced in in the joys of Zoom. Yes, welcome back. Um, the the third thing: make sure you understand terms and conditions, and then make sure you can afford to make the payments according to the loan terms. And sometimes that means you might need to take a little bit less of a loan. Um, but if you can pay make if you can afford a hundred dollars a week. Don't take a loan out for two hundred dollars a week. You can take a loan out probably for ninety dollars a week to be safe. Hundred dollars to put you at the edge. So understand what payments you can make and what terms you can pay back, so that you're in a good position if you do take that loan. The other thing you can do is all of us is allowed right now. It's actually more than that with COVID, but normal situations we're allowed a free annual credit review or report every year this won't necessarily give you a credit score but with these reports if you go to annualcreditreport.com they have to give you um, a credit report from Experian from um, Equifax and TransUnion some people will pull all three at the same time and compare them and make sure there's nothing that they didn't know about some people will take one in one month and then they'll take a second one maybe two or three months later and they'll take another one three months later so that they can pull down at different times of the year now right now because of covid there's actually a law and you're allowed to take your credit report once a week i believe it is and um they just changed the time frame it was until the end of april but it's longer so right now if you're curious again you can't get your score but you, it does show you exactly what's on your credit report. So, all right, in summary, um, does anybody have any questions for me or any, anything you're curious about that, that we can touch upon? I'm not hearing too much, so I'm. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. And Leo was saying that he's not seeing anything on Facebook either. Okay. Um, well, with that, I, I'm, I think we can wrap up then. If somebody does have something, they can reach out to myself or Leo or Bree, and, and we'll get in touch with you right away. Um, do pay attention to your credit. It affects us all in so many different ways especially now um, 
where there's so many different things happening um, with emergencies and funding and this and that. So make sure you're aware and don't feel bad. Don't worry about where you are today because wherever you are, that can be improved upon. So we, we can always come up with strategies to help make that better. So I've seen a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to check my score. Well, you're better off checking it and knowing it than um, getting blindsided by, by not checking it. So with that, Bree, I'll turn it back over to you. But thanks from NEF for allowing us to share today. And thanks for everybody that attended. We appreciate you and wish you the best. All right, folks, thank you so much for attending. Jim, Leo, thank you for coming and talking with us today. Um, I am um, pasting, Leo, I think you sent that to the panelists. I'm sending it to everyone. Uh, this is the link to um, um, NEF's uh, um, events. So definitely go check that out. Um, also check out our calendar. Uh, where we will have um, a lot more Start Omaha uh, events going on and then general entrepreneurial events throughout the, um, the month. Uh, we always have NEF in for a couple of times a month. They're always great webinars. So please go ahead and check those out. And I'll also be sending out an email later that will have um, the user's guide for this. So that you will have the user's guide for the presentation. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us at programs at DoSpace um, or reach out to uh, the Nebraska Enterprise Fund and they're always great and happy to answer questions. Um, and if we don't have any other questions, I think we're gonna sign off for today. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you everyone.